This morning, I'm going to do it a little bit different. I'll say this up front. Namely, I wanted to talk a little bit about what does it mean to, does God hear our prayers? And there's a little bit of this book I've been reading, The Eclipse of God, specifically Martin Buber, the philosopher's response to Carl Jung, and whether we're only talking to ourselves in our head, or the spiritual is about a being beyond ourselves. So I'm, I'm going to explore this in what would be our discussion, um, in post-discussion for those who want to stay on for like 10 minutes. But, but the psalm is rich enough, I want to stay focused on the psalm. So with that, it's 931, Psalm 81, and I dedicate this psalm, this morning's learning, to Cliff and Sarah Cornell for their constancy. They have not missed a psalm class, and this is Psalm 81. And it comes to mind that quality of constancy, I'll say up front about what's fascinating to me about this psalm. I have been reading this psalm every Thursday as the rabbis and the Talmud designated this as the psalm for Thursday. I'll talk in a moment as to why. But I've been reading it every Thursday as if by rote, being I know the words, they're familiar words, but I never took the time to study these words, to know that this is a psalm largely of God speaking. Here's another a comment in that regard. There are those who say that prayer is when we speak to God. Study of sacred text is hearing God speak to us. And that's largely true of Psalms. Psalms are largely words to God, but as we'll see in Psalm 81, Excellent. most of it is God talking to us. So that, again, creates a dynamic. And that's the question. Is there a dynamic? So back to Psalm for Thursday. Why Psalm 81? It's the fifth day of creation, the rabbis in the Talmud say. And that's the day in which the fish and the birds are created. Here's something else to know. The first three days get filled by days four, five, and six. Day one, light. Day two, water and heavens. With Then the earth. So day four is the sun and moon. They're, they're filling in that space of light. Day five, which is today. Thursday is day five. That's when the skies and the fish are filling their respective creations. And on day six, that's when the animals are put onto the earth. And then Sabbath on the seventh day. So day five today, the psalm is the description of the creation of um, animals. And the rabbis see that as an image of celebration. It's the first things created. The birds and the fish are the first things created, and that's rejoicing. So that's day five. And that's also my introduction to say, and now to add a comment. If I've been doing this psalm and my prayers by rote, unaware of the deeper significance of the words, why do I do it every day? So a brief comment, because it'll lead into my uh, epilogue today, which is, is God listening? I once heard my teacher, Ron Wolfson, who I'll be interviewing January 13th in the evening in regard to small groups. Ron Wolfson, I once heard him say many years ago that children who regularly ate dinner with their parents were more likely to be national merit scholars. And it was the key variable. I'm not sure if it's right, but it stuck with me. It was so many years ago, my children were small. And I thought my dinner is not, conversations are not particularly illuminating. We're just trying to get the kids to sit down and eat. 
And it led me, particularly because of the age they were at, to ask what is the value of the regularity of coming together as a family? How does that influence success? And it seemed to me that my children came to the table because Linda and I insisted that they sit down at that time. And in being together, there was a sense of prioritizing being a family and there would be conversations that took place because of the regularity about what was going on in our lives that created a stronger bond. And then I thought that's the link to prayer. I go to prayer as a sense of a rhythm of religious activity. I might even say, because God is asking me to come. And so every morning I put on my talit and tefillin as this morning and I pray. What do I gain? An identity, a self-identity of being a religiously committed person, a seeker that comes with discipline. And even though most days my prayer is checklist, I'm going through the words, I'm not thinking about it, sometimes words do pop out. And more, because of the familiarity of prayer, when I feel a need to pray, I have a familiarity, a rhythm, so that that too can take place. So to pull this back together, Psalm 81, the Psalm of Thursday, is a psalm that I've prayed for years, and I'm so I'm surprised by the richness of the psalm that I never saw before I prepared it for this sharing. At the same time, this psalm is most widely known as the psalm of Rosh Hashanah. I shared in my letter of introduction an Israeli stamp quoting verse 4. Blast on the new moon shofar with the appointed time for a day of our celebration. Those words from this psalm are recited on the Kiddush of Rosh Hashanah. It's recited before the Shema on Rosh Hashanah, and Psalm 81 is read on Rosh Hashanah in the Musaf, and it's directed to do so already in the time of the Talmud. Again, the Babylonian Talmud is edited in the 5th century, um, 6th century, by the year 500 in Baghdad, and becomes the authoritative guide of legal conversation for Jews. And there in Rosh Hashanah 16a and 16b, it says this is to be recited on Rosh Hashanah. And in 30b, they will say that this was the psalm read when sacrifices were brought in the time of the temple on Rosh Hashanah. Robert Alter, in his introduction to Psalm 81, will say that this was a psalm describing a major celebration in temple times of the new moon, a celebration with full orchestra. And yet at the same time, the key word in verse 4, bekese, which I translated a point in time and I'll come back to, is an ambiguous term. This is another one of those Psalms of Asaf in which there's a lot of rarely used words that allow for differences. So Benjamin um, Siegel, who I'm so fond of, his book, A New Psalm, the most literary of the analyses of the Psalms that I have, of my resources, he will say that this was a Psalm not for the new moon, but for Sukkot. Because when it says, in the day of our celebration, in Hebrew, Leyom Chagenu, Chag, is usually identified as a pilgrimage holiday, and the premier holiday called Hechag, the holiday, is Sukkot. So Benjamin Siegel sees this as a Sukkot psalm which to pull back, and then I'm going to put it up. We read Psalms on these three levels. From a biblical author's point of view, which we can only guess at, because we're often not told who the author is and what prompted the writing. How 
second level, our sages of the Talmud and the medieval rabbis for whom these were words of liturgy, of words to God. How did they relate to the words, which can have a whole different understanding, like yesterday. It can be about exile rather than about the ten tribes. And the third level, how are these words meaningful to us? Well, with that, let me put up the psalm, and then I'll go back when I'm done reading it and show you some of those poetic plays. The psalm is divided into two, verses 1 to 6a. 6b is a bridge and subject to many different ways of understanding. And then beginning with verse 7, you'll see quotation marks. That's where I have God speaking, but God will also be quoting. So there'll be quotes within the quotes. Verses 10 and 11 are the first of the two Ten Commandments. And one last, the traditional commentaries don't tend to use quotation marks in the English. Robert Alter does, Benjamin Siegel does, and they differ. Verse 16 shifts to the third person. So Robert Alter writes in his commentary, well, God sometimes speaks in the third person. Benjamin Siegel ends his speech of God with verse 15. He hears this as the psalmist speaking verse 16 and 17, though the very end, back to quotations, is another paraphrase of the Bible, specifically Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 13 and then 14. And that's a bit of the punchline, if you know 32, 15. And so even here, what's God's voice and not God's voice is also a choice, if you will, an interpretation. Psalm 81. For the conductor on the Gitit of Asaf, arouse a joyous song to God, our strength, Shout out to the God of Jacob. Raise up him and sound the timbrel, a pleasant lyre with a lute. Blast on the new moon shofar with the appointed time for a day of our celebration. For a statute for Israel it is a judgment of the God of Jacob, a testament of Joseph. God ordained it when he went forth over the land of Egypt, a language I did not know, I hear. I removed his shoulder from the burden, his palms from the basket were freed. In straits you called out and I released you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear my people and I will testify against you. Israel, im tishma li, if you would listen to me, let there not be among you a strange God, nor should, shall you bow down to a foreign God. I am Adonai your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. And Israel did not yield to me. So I let them go with the visions of their heart. Let them walk in their own counsels. If only my people would listen to me. Israel in my ways would walk. At once their enemies I would subdue. And against their adversaries turn my hand. Haters of Adonai deceive God and their time will endure forever. But God would feed him from the fat of wheat, and with honey from the rock, I will say to you. Hmm. Well, I can't help but give away the punchline, because that's, again, the nature of this artistry. The closing line 
is 32.13. It flips the verses because 32.14, which comes at the beginning, but God would feed him from the fat of wheat. Chalev is literally fat, often translated as abundance or the richness of wheat, the finest of wheat. So that's Ha'azinu. It's Moses' closing poem to the people. And then there's this line of being fed honey from the rock, which is 3213. My teacher, Larry Kushner, the first book he ever wrote, and he's uh, worth reading, is a book called Honey from the Rock, probably based on that verse. What does, first of all, Honey from the Rock even mean? Ibn Ezra, the medieval commentator, says that the honey is the sweet water that emerged from the rock in the desert, which was Miriam's well. So that's the medieval understanding, that this is a metaphor for the miracle of the water coming from the rock. Others understand it as an image of honey within crevices of a rock. In either case, here's where it's a remarkable punchline. 32.15 reads, so let me, let me read it in the original, 32. 13 and 14. 32.13, God carried them over the earth's highest places to feast on the crops of the field. God let them suckle honey from the bedrock, oil from the flinty cliff. They had cheese of cattle, milk of sheep, fat of lambs, rams of the Bashan, and luscious fat wheat. They drank the blood of grapes for wine. And now the verse that follows these two, Jeshurun thus became fat and rebelled. You grew fat, thick, and gross. The nation abandoned the God who made it and spurned the mighty one who was its support. They provoked God's jealousy with alien practices, made God angry with vile deeds. So to somebody who knows the Bible second nature, it's a mixed message, the punchline, with God's voice. Meaning, does this mean to say, I've given you so much and I'm not sure I can trust you? This time, Listen to me. So what I often look for, what's the bullseye? What's the middle line of a psalm? The three words that are the middle are verse 9. Im tishma li. If you would only listen to me. This word shma is the key repetitive word. It first appears in verse 6. So, svat lo yedati eshma, a language I did not know I hear. And the word shma, twice it's in verse 9, it's in verse 12, it's in verse 14, and it's coupled with Yisrael, the people of Israel, three times. Shma Yisrael is also Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1 which is the introduction to Moses' teaching of the Ten Commandments. So let's look at the two commandments that get quoted. Verse 10 and verse 11. Not unlike that closing image of Deuteronomy where the verses are flipped, here the verses are flipped. You get, as it's understood in the Jewish count, the second command and then the first command paraphrased with verse 9, Shema Ami, being chapter, the beginning of chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, that leads into the Ten Commandments. So, let there not be among you a strange God, nor shall you bow down to a foreign God. That's the second command, which is, this is a monogamous relationship. 
The first command, as Larry Kushner, Honey from the Rock author, frames it. First command is, I am God, you are not. Second command, it's a intimate relationship. So the first command, Anochi. That's the first word of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord, the ever-present one, your God. Adonai, your God, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. And here's a phrase that appears nowhere else in the Bible. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Well, what does it mean? Does it mean that open wide your mouth and I will fill it? It can mean testify to me, praise me, and I will reward you physically. Or it can mean open wide your mouth in praise and I will fill it spiritually. And now a quick corrective. Beware of a good story. Three psalms ago I made a mistake. Namely, I saw a commentary by the Targum, who, which simply means an Aramaic translation. There are a variety of Targums. There's Targum Unclus. He's the most famous. He's the one that I assumed it was because he's the most famous. He's the convert in the first century. And what, what I failed to pause to remember is he only translated the five books of Moses. Then there's a Targum Yonatan who translated the prophets, the Nevi'im. And what's called Targum for Psalms is later... The scholars guess 3rd to 7th century, and it could be more than one Aramaic translator. But Targum here, and, and I, again, had a good story. And the good story was I was looking at a verse and I saw the Targum commentary that was more universalistic. All the kings will bring their offerings, and the Targum added, as offerings to the temple. And I assumed that that was an expression of somebody who was a Jew by choice. But I was wrong because that was not Targum Unclus. That was the Targum of Psalms. And I'm grateful to Ahuva for pointing out my mistake. So I add this because today I'm talking about bigger issues of God. And I grabbed onto that without thinking about it because it was a good story, namely, the Targum as Unclus, the convert being more universalistic. But it, I was inaccurate. Targum of Psalms is not Targum Unclus. So I will come back to this because my key question today is, why pray words by rote and is God listening? And be, that links to this sensitivity of beware of a good story. All right, so a couple more comments about the psalm and its artistry. This key bridge, Sfat lo yadati ashma, verse 6, a language I did not know, I hear. So who's, this is the word of the psalmist, but what is the psalmist referring to? Some will say he's referring to the shofar sound that's come before. A sound that embodies more than mere words. Some say that this is referring to Joseph, who came to Egypt. That's how Steinsaltz, for instance, understands it. And... Deuteronomy 28:49 has this image of I will bring you to a land with a strange language. It could be the slaves that it's referring to. You know, so Joseph went forth a language that, that I did not know. I hear it could be any Israelite or it could be the psalmist saying in a moment I'm going to tell you what I heard God say. Or it can be the introduction to God speaking. So that's to say it could be any one of those possibilities or all of them.
And now God begins to speak. And I'm fascinated, and it's we've seen this before in our psalm study, when God is the speaker. Because again, we think of prayer as speaking to God. What does it mean to be hearing God? And here's what God says. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His palms from the basket were freed. This word, me dude, I translate basket following Robert Alter and Benjamin Siegel, Rashi, he understands it as a cauldron, that the slaves were working in the kitchen doing menial labor. Others understand it as a pot in which the mortar was carried. The contemporary scholars seem to see it as related to Dave, which is a basket, and that it was the basket in which they carried the mud to make the bricks. That's just one example of rare words in which different commentators will find different roots and therefore different translations. Bitsara in straits, you called to me. That's, for instance, Exodus 2.23, where the slaves are crying out. I answered you in the secret places of thunder, unclear, but there is thunder in the plague of hail. There's also thunder at Sinai. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Meribah is the place where Moses would hit the rock both the first time in Exodus and then hit it again in Numbers, but hit it twice and be punished. That's Meribah, the place of rivalry or argument with God. And so God is recounting a past that has God freeing the slaves from carrying the basket of slavery, of the mortar, taking the burden off the shoulders, taking them out of the straits, tsuris, tsara, which will also be the same sound as tsur at the end, which is rock. And now, Ten Commandments, hear my people. The two commandments flipped, 10 and 11, and then God's frustration. But they don't listen to me. I let them go. Verse 13, with the visions of their heart. Here, too, it's an unusual word, bishri root, which the commentators understand in different ways. Rashi understands it as thoughts of the mind, while Radak and others understand it as muscles, and therefore of strength, of physicality, and let them go um, with the hardness of their heart, again, like a muscle of their heart. Um, I translate it as visions, which is playing on the Rashi, that it's a visual image that they are following, walking in their own good counsel. So here's also a line you don't get in the Bible in other places, namely, God saying, here, I let them do what they wanted. I let them go to walk in their own counsels. But now, verse 14. This is, first of all, poetically, a play on verse 12. Lo shama ami, and here it's lu ami shomeali. And lu, lo means in verse 12, they did not. In 14, Lu means, if only my people would listen to me, Israel and my ways would walk. And here we have God on a deeply emotional level, a yearning expressed. If only my people would listen to me. The God of the Bible is a God of relationship, seeking relationship and doing it with pathos, with emotion. And if they would only listen to me, the second part of the speech, I would subdue their enemies against their adversaries, turn my 
my hand. And now again, the question, if this is God speaking in the third person, verse 16, or it's the psalmist, haters of Adonai deceive God and their time will endure forever. But God would feed him from the fat of wheat, again, still third person, but in quotation marks, because this again is the paraphrase of God's words through Moses in Ha'azinu, and with honey from the rock, I will sate you, dot, dot, dot. With that, there is so much more I could say about this psalm, but I'd like some of your reactions. I can react, and we'll give ourselves 10 minutes. We'll then do Kaddish, and then as a special end of the week, I do want to share this concluding question of does God listen to prayer with Martin Buber's critique of Carl Jung for 10 minutes and a personal reflection on that question. But this is first and foremost a psalm exploration. So I now give you the opportunity to ask questions or react to what you found stirring in the psalm for today. Any, any comments or questions? Um, can or Shula, unmute, unmute yourself. I do have a little bit of a question. Yeah. In verse 6, there is sort of a strange spelling of Yosef. Yes. With a hey added in. Right. And I couldn't help but see that there is a yud hey vav and I'm wondering if there is some kind of an under subtextish reference to God within the name Yosef there. Exactly. So let me pick up on Shula's sensitivity. Normally we think of Joseph, who we're reading about this week in our Torah reading, as Yosef. Here, his name is spelled differently than in the Bible normally as Shula sensitively is aware there's an extra letter. That letter is the He. So here it's Yehosef, and the He like in Avraham. Remember, Abraham was originally Abraham's name, Avram. When he entered into the covenant with God, the He was added. Same thing for Sarah. So he became Avraham. So the He becomes God's presence within his name. And in fact, Shula, in the Talmud, Sota 10a, they comment on this very word. And they say that after Joseph displayed forbearance from being seduced by Potiphar's wife, which was the ultimate display of his faithfulness to God, not to be seduced, the hay was added to his name. So that here, and they point to this verse, um, his, this is the name of the Joseph who had been able to overcome seduction. Here's an interesting word play, though. Just again, Asaf is so poetic, you know? So here's a double entendre of meaning also in that same verse. The Testament of Joseph. God ordained it when he went forth over the land of Egypt. Here's the double entendre. Who's being referred to? Joseph going out over the land of Egypt? That's Genesis 41, 45. Ve'yetze Yosef al Eretz Mitzrayim. Joseph went out over the land of Egypt when he's appointed viceroy to scout out the land. Or is this... Uh, because the verse 7 is going to deal with slavery. Is this referring to God going forth out over the land of Egypt as the introduction to freeing the people? So often in Psalms you get words with double meanings. Here you have a phrase that's both pointing backwards to Joseph, forwards to God taking action. Again, I marvel over the poetic purposefulness 
of the choice of words and phrases and the echoes of other biblical moments. Um, another comment or reaction? Jeff, go ahead. Actually a question, and I've yeah. never thought about this before. This psalm has, a, has two faces to it. The, the latter part is God is talking. Yes. So reading this, it kind of occurs to me, you know, today if somebody said, well, this is what God says, and then start speaking like God, we would think they're, we'd say they're channeling and might question their mental abilities. Right, or their psychology. What is the author doing here by yeah. speaking for God? So let me say a comment, but that's what I want to deal with in the epilogue today, because it's a bigger question and a very important question for me as a religious person. What is there a God who is listening exactly. and who speaks or not? Or is that that's the debate between Martin Buber and Carl Jung, where Carl Jung, who's the son of a clergy person and, of course, the great psychologist of the collective unconscious and archetypes, he will say that when we say that God is speaking, it's just archetype. We're just projecting, if you will. It, it's within our own psyche. And Martin Buber will say, that's you're crossing a line. You, as a psychologist, can tell me how the mind works, but you cannot, it's not within your domain to know what's real beyond the mind. And I want to read to you just a paragraph or two and build on that very important question. But here's, here's a little tease. Here's a very important tease. Martin Buber, who again, I'm eager to read to you, had a best friend, Franz Rosenzweig. In fact, the two of them translated the Bible into German together. And that came out in 1936. Die Schrift und Hire I don't speak German, but that's the title. I say it because here was their goal. They said, and you'll appreciate this as students of Psalms, that there's a cadence and a rhythm in the biblical writing that we want to convey in German. So it was the first translation that sought to convey the biblical idioms and rhythms in a foreign language. So that's Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig as partners in creating that very important biblical translation. There's a man uh, who, who did it recently in English, um, Everett Fox, I believe, um, did such a translation trying to create the cadences in English of the five books of Moses. That's the five books of Moses. So here's the punchline. Psalm 1 and 2 are the only psalms quoted in this psalm, right? I mean, commandment 1 and 2 though they're flipped. Why, as, why only the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments in this psalm? There's something different about the first two commandments than the other eight. The first two, and again, I say in the Jewish count, because Protestants count differently than Catholics. That's an aside. In terms of whether the first is an introduction or a psalm, I am the Lord your God. Okay, but back to the point. In the Jewish count, the first two is I am the Lord your God. It's first and second person. And then the third command, you shall have no other gods, will flip into the third person. So the rabbis will say the people only heard the first two commandments directly from God, and then they fell away. They could take no more. And therefore, the rest is as reported by Moses in the third person. The two commandments we have here are the two that the rabbis say were spoken directly by God. That's a, it's just a commentary. Others will see, of course, all ten spoken by God. And God, again, can go into the third person. But here's the punchline of the teaching. Franz Rosenzweig. He says, what was revealed at Mount Sinai? Only the first letter of the Ten Commandments. So ver the first letter, the first word is here, verse 11. 
Anochi. I am the Lord your God. And he said, what did the people experience at Mount Sinai? Only the olive. What's the sound of the olive? It's a trick question. The olive has no sound. What did the people experience at Mount Sinai? The presence of God that transcends language. And all the words of the Ten Commandments, all the words of the Bible, simply flow from the experience of God's presence intuitively. Yeah. And so that's an opportunity to honor Franz Rosenzweig, to point out the Aleph here in our psalm of the first of the Ten Commandments word, Anochi. And so what I'd like to do now is pause to give those the opportunity to say Kaddish to do so. This morning, I want to recognize Sherry Rettinger, who is in the midst of Shiva for her mom, and her husband Herb is there, and, th and she is in the midst of Shiva for her mother, Roz Feldman, wife of Bert Feldman. N next week, January 6th, would have been their 70th wedding anniversary. And so in honoring Roz and others who have a yurt site or are in mourning, I invite you to join together in the saying of Kaddish. Yitkadal v'yitkadal shemei rapa v'alma divra hirukei v'yamlich mahute b'chaye chom u'yomei chom u'v'chaye d'chol beit Yisrael Ba'agala uvizman kariv vimru yehe raba mevara leolam olmei almaya yitbara viyishtabach viyitbar viyitbam viyitnase viyitadar viyitale. Vitalal Shemei Kucha Rihu Leela Minko Birchata Vishirata Tushmata Venechemata Damiran Yama Vimru Amen Yehe Lama Rabba Bin Shemaya Vahayim Alenu El Yisrael Vimru Amen Ose Shalomav Kuyase Shalom Alenu Vilkel Koyoshve Tevel Vimru Amen. So again, this is now an epilogue, and it's not, I know I'm self conscious about time. So I know people have responsibilities, but I am. You know, with a question, somebody who watches my, our conversations after wrote me an email last week asking me, do I really think God listens? Mm -hmm. And I picked up a book I had on my bookshelf for a while called The Eclipse of God. Martin Buber um, will be responding in this book to the philosophers between the two wars, namely to Kierkegaard, to Heidegger, Carl Jung. And the question that he has, Martin Buber, is does God listen? What does it mean to have a relationship with God? The most famous of the books by Martin Buber is called I Thou. Martin Buber taught that we experience God in the in-between. That was what I was making reference to last night, Sherry and Herb, about um, here's a wordplay that I shared at the Shiva Minyan last night. If you take love plus love in Hebrew, that's 13 plus 13 in Gematria, equals 26, which is God's name, yud Hey vav Hey. That's again a playful way of saying that God is found where love is present in the in-between. So for Martin Buber, God is the experience that is real 
of a quality of awareness that we experience in the in-between of relationship. And for Martin Buber, writing in German, God is the thou, with a capital T, the thou in which there's this quality of presence in the world. And when we reach out to that quality of presence to speak, we have holy encounter. But it's also when we're with another person or even with a tree in which the experience of relationship is for its own sake, we experience a holy moment. He makes a distinction between I thou and I it. I, it is most of our relationships, the it being an object. So if we are going to the grocery store, the checkout person at Trader Joe's may ask how we're doing, but we're really there not for a relationship. We're there for that. We can be friendly, but we're there for them to do a service for us. In that sense, it's an object relationship. That's not bad. To treat a person like an object does not mean to treat them poorly, but it's not a holy moment. <laughs> it's most of our experiences. Most of the time, we're engaged with the world as an object to meet our needs. But he would emphasize God is real. And so he now responds to Carl Jung. And I just want to read a little bit of this essay. And he asks the following. This is, um, so he says the following. And by the way, Carl Jung answered. This is now the follow-up to the Carl Jung response to him. It's the supplement. Does that which the man of faith calls the divine action arise merely from his own inner self? Or can the action of a super psychic being also be included in it? Jung answers that it arises from one's own inner self, meaning our experience of God is simply our self projecting. It's our psyche. I have remarked in this regard that these are not legitimate assertions of a psychologist who as such has no right to declare what exists beyond the psychic and what does not, or to what extent there are actions which come from elsewhere. So first, Buber's critique is the psychologist's expertise is only on the psyche, but not on reality, necessarily. And so he'll continue. My own belief in revelation, which is not mixed up with any orthodoxy, I'll add, Buber was not a halachic Jew but he was a man as a philosopher deeply involved with what we would call spirituality or a belief in the presence of God. My own belief from revelation does not mean that I believe that finished statements about God were handed down from heaven to earth. Rather, so he says, I don't believe that God necessarily, what we read in the Bible is God's direct word. Rather, it means that the human substance is melted by the spiritual fire which visits it, and there now breaks forth from it a word, a statement which is human in its meaning and form, human conception and human speech, and yet witnesses to God who stimulated it and to God's will. We are revealed to ourselves and cannot express it otherwise than as something revealed. Not only statements about God, but all statements in general are human. Yet is anything positive or negative thereby assert, ascertained by their truth? The distinction which is here in question is thus not that between psychic and non-psychic statements, but that between psychic statements to which a super- psychic reality corresponds and psychic statements to which none corresponds. So what he is saying is clearly everything we experience, we experience within our own mind, but that doesn't mean that there's not a tree that we're looking at 
or in this meaning there can be an something beyond us even though we're experiencing within ourselves and the real question is is it only within ourselves our perception or is there something outside of ourselves that we're processing and for him there is a being with a capital B that is getting processed in our psyche that allows for experiences of revelation. And so one last comment of reading, and then I'll pull this together. But Jung now brings to my attention that men do in fact have many different images of God, which they themselves make. I think I was already aware of this and have many times stated and explained it. But that which is essential is still the fact that they are just images. No person of faith imagines that he possesses a photograph of God or a reflection of God in a magic mirror. He each knows that he has painted it, he and others, but it was painted just as an image, a likeness. That means it was painted in the intention of faith directed towards the imageless, whom the image portrays, that is, means. The intention of faith directed towards an existing being, towards one who exists, is common to men who believe out of varied experience. Neither psychology nor any other science is competent to investigate the truth of the belief in God. It is the right of their representatives to keep aloof. It is not within their disciplines, their right to make judgments about the belief in God as about something which they know. <laughs> so that's his challenge to Jung. So he says, look, of course people will have different images because the images are not a direct portrayal of God. They're just a metaphor, an attempt to give a way to represent because we're human, we need a representation, an image, but that's not God. God is without description, is other, is an experience with being. And so back to the Psalm, and then I'll let you react. Back to the Psalm, is this God's voice? Who is God? What it seems to me is this is bibliodrama for me. This is the psalmist who has in Buber concept a genuine experience with a being that transcends his or her own life. A being that is real, a being that allowed for redemption from Egypt. And that story is part of the story of the psalmist and of the Jews. A being who yearns for relationship. But what the content is of that relationship, it's no different than an image of God. It's human language, human story, trying to describe what it means to be in relationship with a being who represents, and is not only representing, who is a presence within creation of love and consciousness with a capital C. There is a mystery to the nature of human consciousness, human self-awareness, and there is a mystery to consciousness with a capital C within creation itself, which as experienced as that olive, that, that letter of the Hebrew alphabet that has no sound, is the experience with the thou, with the presence of a vibrating presence that we give human images to. And Maimonides writes this also. Maimonides in the 12th century will say that when we talk in the Bible about God's arm, we're not literally talking about God's arm. It's a metaphor for God's strength because we use our arms for strength. And he goes a step further. When he talks about God's emotion in the Bible, the expressions of, I am a jealous God, Maimonides will say that's a metaphor because we relate to a God of emotion to pull it together. And back to Jeff's question, 
This is God's voice as the psalmist hears it, filtered with the memory of the experiences of the Bible and is profoundly real, calling to see the world through God's eyes. With that, I'll stop. There's more to say. It's a very big topic, but it was an opportunity to um, address it this week at the end. And then I want to close with the nature of good stories. I corrected myself in terms of Christmas and New Year's. So any uh, closing reactions to Martin Buber and Carl Jung? Um, Alex, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. I think uh, if I understand correctly, it seems like uh, Buber is saying uh, we all have to construct for ourselves our own personal uh, golden calf. Well, he, he, where he would go one step further, though, Alex, he would acknowledge that we all do create metaphors. That's what it means to be human. But he would say that unlike the golden calf, where the calf becomes, or at least as the rabbis understand the golden calf, the god, Buber would say we must always be aware that the metaphor is only a metaphor. You know, that's the image in Zen. The finger pointing to the moon is not the moon. It's just the finger <laughs> pointing to the moon and that we often confuse. Or Maimonides asks, how is it that if Abraham experienced God, how so soon after Abraham did there become idolatry? So in the Guide for the Perplexed, Maimonides says, people are people. And so the stars became um, symbols of God's creativity and soon the stars became that which was worshipped rather than the creator. And so idolatry came into play. So in sum, Alex, for Martin Buber, the distinction between symbol and that which is real with a capital R is essential. And that the experience of God is the in-between within the thou is very different than the human attempt to remember and designate, design, the symbols of the golden calf. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, again, I'm very self-conscious about time. If there's one last comment, then I just want to comment on the good story piece. If so, I, I'll just say uh, just one ahead, little quick thing. Uh, verse 13, uh, yeah. you know, so the, this, this, uh, the, the discussion uh, is, is connects quite closely to verse 13, at least in my mind, especially it says, let them walk in their own counsels, and talking yeah. about the visions of the heart. Yeah. So, uh, I was reminded of uh, Joshua Judges, and I don't remember just which, which one or both, but there's a phrase in there, it talks about several times, it talks about uh, the people uh, doing what was right in their own sight. And I can remember reading it the first time thinking, well, okay, that's, you know, but then realizing much later that it was a, uh, a critique of what was going on in the people's minds and in their own heart. And so, uh, go ahead. I'll just, I'll, go, I'll stop there. Go ahead. So I'm so glad you did that. Namely, focus us on verse 13 to pull together the psalm and going back to the psalm. And that's to say, here's the, what Richard's sensitive to. So I let them go with the desires of their heart. Let them walk in their own good counsel. And Rashi comments that this word, Shri Root, which I translate as desires, um, Libam of their heart, desires, he says it's from Shri Root, which means to watch. So it's their visions. I let them go with their visions. Some of the, like in the art scroll, they translate it as fantasies of. I let them go with the fantasies of their heart, the visions of their heart. In fact, I meant to translate this as visions. I have to go back and retranslate that word, which is that we as people naturally need to create a vision, an object to represent an experience. That's how we're wired because we are physical. And I, God says here, I let them follow their visions, but it led them astray because they got confused over the visions versus who I am and what it means to hear. 
To hear is not to have an image. The verb of listening is to take in words without a image. And that is the key verb here. And the key verb before the Ten Commandments is listen, which is don't create the images, take in hearing, which enables relationship. And so to pull together Psalm 81, Psalm 81 is a psalm of celebration of a new moon, of rejoicing in a holiday that leads to hearing God say, you know, you're happy on this day, but you're often unaware that relationship means following in my way, if only you listened. And so here's a closing thought, and that is something that most Christians would not know, which is from 1568 to 1960, New Year's was called the Feast of the Circumcision of the Lord. And in 1968, the name was changed. It was always called the Solemnity of Mary. It's now called the Octave Day of the Nativity of the Lord in the Catholic tradition, which is to say, if Christmas is the day of birth, the eighth day is New Year's, right? That's day eight. And when a new, when a baby is born, the celebration is only on the eighth day. And so tonight and tomorrow, is the celebration of the bris. To, and that's not just a Jewish perspective. Again, from 1568 to 1960 in the Catholic Church, January 1st was the Feast of the Circumcision of the Lord. And so pulling that together, there are biblical <clears throat> implications that then get you know secularized, get cut off. People don't remember the roots. And to know roots, to read Psalms as an example, is to enrich our understanding of the world. So with that, I wish each of us a new year, a 2021, of greater ease and greater freedom, and a year of sustained health for all of us. So thank you for starting off December 31st with me. Happy New Year.